So uh, welcome everybody to uh, the second webinar of uh, SEMLA 2020. So SEMLA stands for Software Engineering for uh, Machine Learning Applications. And um, so if, go here. Uh, if uh, So I'm Bram Adams, I'm uh, one of the organizers here. We are six people organizing uh, SEMLA. It's already the uh, third edition. The first two were physical, last couple of years in uh, Polytechnique. This year, due to circumstances, online. And uh, so what is SEMLA about? Why all these editions? So it's about basically engineering AI applications, so software applications. Uh, and why? Well, because on one hand, you have the world of software engineering, you have a long tradition of a lot of best practices, processes, and so on, so requirements, development all the way to deployment, uh, production, DevOps, and so on. And on the other hand, you have the world of machine learning, AI, with all these breakthroughs, all these innovations that really can change people's lives. However, since these things are being uh, incorporated into even safety critical systems, there's really a need to actually see, combine to really build these systems with, with decent practices from software engineering world. So the question is how to do that? Where is the intersection? How do you combine these worlds together? So the past two years, we've been exploring this with, with speakers uh, from different companies, uh, universities, and so on. And this year, we continue this, um, uh, this idea. Uh, so this in particular, we have like six uh, webinars scheduled. There's a second one yesterday at uh, Jigo, uh, talking about DevOps and... Um, and machine learning AI. Um, and today we have the, uh, the uh, pleasure to uh, basically have uh, Christian Kessner uh, as a speaker. So Christian is an associate prof at uh, Carnegie Mellon. He's also director of uh, PhD uh, program on software engineering and he has been working a long time on, on software variability. Lots of uh, work has been done in that area uh, by him and, and his uh, collaborators. Uh, he's also very interested in, in uh, software ecosystems and, and making them sustainable. And in the recent couple of years, he's really been um, interested in actually uh, teaching, teaching AI and how to build AI uh, systems using real and, and high quality uh, software engineering practices. And so we're very looking forward to, to his talk today. Uh, so while I'll stop sharing this and, and Christian can stand up, I'll also explain a bit um, here we go. And also, uh, I invite Christian yes, to start screen sharing. So I'll explain a bit how this webinar works. So basically, Christian will, will uh, give a presentation. At the end, there's time for questions. So your questions, you don't need to wait until the end. Please post all your questions in the Q&A uh, area here in Zoom at the bottom. Uh, you notice you, you cannot use chat uh, messages, but you can actually uh, send the questions and comment on other people's questions, vote them up. And at the end, we'll, we'll start with the highest, most popular questions and work our way down uh, until we run out of time. There will also be a recording of this webinar. Uh, and if Christian is okay, there also might be slides uh, being shared uh, for later uh, perusers at the uh, on the website. But let's start with Christian. Yeah, no problem. Um, thanks for the introduction. I wanted to say a few words about me, but I guess I can skip this. Um, I am interested in this mostly from a teaching perspective, right? So my own background is in kind of research on product lines and computer systems, but I've been interested in kind of teaching how to do software engineering for systems that have a machine learning or an AI component. It's kind of this AI enabled systems. Today I want to talk about kind of the different perspectives, right? So you have software engineers and data scientists working together with different backgrounds, how we can support this, what are the specific goals and so on. So just to frame this a little bit more, but I think this is, uh, this is already kind of, Bram gave a good introduction, right? So we care about building and operating, maintaining software systems that have some machine learning components, big or small. And we typically need some sort of interdisciplinary collaborative teams, people with different backgrounds. So I'm specifically not talking about the part where data scientists build models, right? So kind of in a notebook, doing the CAD competitions, things like this. Um, should I try a different microphone? I can if you want. Yeah, um, if it's possible, or maybe less moving. Now it's better, actually. Is this any better? Yes. All right, let's try this. So. Let me know again if, if you want to try something else. But um, so, where was I? I'm not talking about the part where data scientists win kind of Kaggle competitions or kind of focus on um, building the best model, the high, highest accuracy model, but I'm thinking about building entire systems, right? It's also not about 
yeah, can't get my mouse back. Um, building the toolkits for machine learning, right? It's building the system that uses those toolkits. And since I'm often talking to software engineering audiences, they often feel like we're building systems with AI components all the time. We're building things like better auto completion tools or tools where we detect duplicate bug reports and so on. And we use machine learning for this. But I think we as software engineers are kind of bad role models. Um, we're rarely ever building production systems. Uh, we are not representative of really the user um, community of our students going out into the world and building cool applications that have machine learning in them. So what I'm thinking about are things like you're contributing to Microsoft PowerPoint, where most of the system might not be machine learning focused, but they introduce more and more machine learning components. Right? So one of these ideas is the slide design mechanism, design ideas, uh, where you can click on a button and then you see a couple of suggestions of how you could redesign your slide. Right? So you have a machine learning component and it's part of a larger system. It's integrated into a larger system. Here's an alternative thing that I'm going to talk about more. It's Temi is a transcription service where you can audio, uh, upload an audio file, maybe from an interview or from a podcast, and you get the uh, you get the transcript back. So this thing is very heavily focused around an AI component, right? So the primary focus is there's a big AI component or machine learning component that does a transcription, but still you need to build an entire system around this. You can think about kind of a scenario where maybe a PhD student has developed this transcription service, maybe has improved the accuracy by two more percent, and this was a breakthrough, and you publish a bunch of papers. But if you want to commercialize this as a solution, you actually need to think about how to build a system where you have a page where you can go to, you can upload an audio. Millions of users might upload audio. You want to store this, you want to show the results, you want to improve this, you need a billing system. Right? So lots of additional concerns to actually build a production system, even if the machine learning component is an important part. And to build this, we need people of different roles. Right? I'm going to simplify in this talk, and I'm going to primarily talk about data scientists and software engineers. Yesterday, you also talked about operations. Right? So there are many different people that work together on this. But I think to build these systems successfully, at least these two roles, we need to really think about. And they have different backgrounds and different expertise. I probably don't need to explain this too much, um, but software engineering is more than just programming, right? Software engineers, people that we train in software engineering, um, they make all kinds of limit uh, of important engineering decisions, engineering judgment under limited resources and information, right? So you're building systems to a budget, you're making hard trade-off decisions, you're dealing with the messiness of the real world, and you're trading off of many different qualities that you care about. In our master program on software engineering, we have this running joke that the answer to much, pretty much every question is, it depends, right? So we have posters, 20 years of it depends to celebrate like the 20th anniversary of this program. But the point is, it not just depends, but the, the mark of a good software engineer is that the software engineer will be able to make a judgment call. They will make, give them a specific scenario. They will be able, what does it depend on? And in this specific case, what decision should we would take, right? Kind of making engineering judgments under specific situations. And again, I'm oversimplifying and I'm probably being slightly unfair to some of the machine learning people, but the most of the machine learning courses and talks and blog posts that I've seen kind of getting into data science, they're kind of narrowly focused on the modeling techniques or on building models. So understanding how deep neural networks work internally or how you would build decision trees or give them a specific data set, how do you build a model that has the highest accuracy, kind of the Kaggle competitions out there, right? So you have the data set, multiple people trying to compete for the best solution and by best it means highest accuracy in a notebook. I've seen almost no books or courses that actually go from how to build a model to how to deploy a model, how to build a larger system around a model, um, and think about other engineering aspects beyond accuracy of a model. Again, I'm simplifying, but what I want to point out here is that we have these two different groups of people that come from different backgrounds, that often have different 
kind of educational backgrounds, different specialties, and that's actually a good thing. So to build systems, we need both, and I'm going to argue that we need to make them work together. It's sometimes in practice and in industry, there's a view that we should find people that know all of this together. They're sometimes referred to as unicorns, right? people who are really good at data science and statistics and also have software engineering experience and know how to build the systems and actually know all of this together. But those people are actually fairly rare. Right, so hard to find. So you typically want to build teams that have different people with different specialties, different roles, um, and have them work together. And I want to talk more about uh, where this is going. And so coming back to this, if you want to build a system like this, you need somebody who has a specialty to build the deep neural, neural architecture, to do the transcription service, build the machine learning component, and get it to a high enough accuracy. But you also need somebody who can build the system, scale the system, deploy it, um, think about how to do the payment options, how to think about how to get feedback and improve it over time. So just coming from a software engineering perspective, what changes really? Um, do we need to change our software engineering practices? Well, there are a couple of things that change. Let me just go through them. The first thing is we don't really have specifications anymore, right? So as software engineers, we kind of are used to reason about uh, specifications, and then we say we have a bug if something doesn't match the specification. But with machine learning systems, if you have a transcribe function that you're learning from data in some form, or you're predicting recidivism or something like this, What's the specification? We don't really know, right? It's even hard to say what is a bug because we don't have a specification. We're kind of okay with being correct 90% of the time and 10, wrong 10% of the time and different accuracy levels. We also start thinking about the environment way more, um, thinking about feedback loops and data drift. So for example, uh, for many years, um, YouTube was recommending conspiracy theory videos much more than any other videos on the platform. And from the perspective of the machine learning algorithm, this was rational. The goal was to increase engagement, and there were a bunch of people who were watching conspiracy videos a lot, right? So once people started watching some of them, they watched more and more and more. So recommending these videos actually was pushing engagement, but it was creating this feedback loop where you actually drove uh, people into a spiral of getting really deep into these con conspiracy theories. Right? So you really need to start thinking about these kind of issues. Um, you also need to think about that these machine learning components are hard to think of as a module in, that you can reason about in isolation. A lot of systems, here's a lane assist, very big architecture, um, um, consists of multiple machine learning components that com reason with multiple sensors and the output of one machine learning component flows into the next. And it might actually be that improving one component will degrade the performance of the entire system. It becomes very hard to reason about this. And then also testing with test data gets you only so far. So at some point you need to test in production. And here's an example of Microsoft's Tay chatbot turning racist after only a day, uh, interacting in production with other people, right? So this is risky potentially. So we need to think about doing this. And the last part I'm talking about here is kind of, we have to deal way more with data versioning, data provenance at scale. So many ch more challenges here. So lots of things new, but do we really need new, new software engineering for building AI-enabled systems? I would argue that actually for a lot of these things, we actually have tools. It's not that completely different. So yes, we don't have specifications for machine learning components, but if we are honest with ourselves, we don't have good specifications most of the time that we're building traditional software systems anyway. Right? So very vague specifications are very common. We do agile methods precisely because we often don't have upfront specifications and the customer needs to kind of see to know what they want. And also we have a long tradition of building safe systems from unreliable components, right? Even if certain components may be unreliable from hardware or software perspective. We know how to build systems that are overall safe. And I think we can learn a lot from that. I also have a pet, no. Also, the environment is important in machine learning, yes, but not only in machine learning. This is actually very, very long, uh, 
a very traditional view of requirements engineering. Michael Jackson's seminal ICSI 95 paper talks about the world and the machine, the interface, what can the software know about the real world? Um, how to reason about this? This is, I think, the right view to also think about machine learning here. So it's not all completely different and new. We have a lot of tools to think about these things. Um, Non-monotonic effects, yes, but again, I, I come from a background in product lines and we think about feature interactions all the time, cyber physical systems, we reason about interactions of things. There's a reason that we don't just do unit testing, that we do system testing and so on. And testing and production we have done for a very long time in software engineering, right? Chaos engineering, A-B testing, continuous deployment, feature flex, and so on. There's lots of things that we can learn. You talked about a bunch of these things also yesterday. And then also data, there's a huge amount of stuff available that we can learn on. So really what I'm trying to get at, that yes, there are lots of concerns here, but a lot of them are not fundamentally new. To me, this is much more an education problem than a research problem. I think we need to start thinking about much more deliberately about how to build machine learning applications, how to build systems that have a machine learning uh, component. And I think the mistake that we are making is that when building traditional systems, we might get away with pretty poor software engineering practices, right? So you don't do a, soft, a, a really critical safety analysis if you're just building a simple web page for something. But by introducing machine learning component, what we're doing is we're raising the complexity of these systems. We introduce unreliable components. We very often use this in a set, setting where there's actually risk and safety issues and so on that we actually need to think about. So the argument that I'm trying to make is that we need to get serious about applying software engineering techniques. Yes, we need to adjust some of them. And yes, some will be new, there will be some new research, but I think a lot of time is really about bringing software engineers into the loop and bringing them into a team and working together. So again, I have this view simplified, but yes, uh, we have data scientists and software engineers and they need to work together. And I'm very much coming from a software engineering perspective, right? So my, my view is certainly biased. And data scientists and software engineers have different roles, but that's okay, that's actually really good, right? They have specialties, they bring something to the table, they work together. So how, how should we make them work together? Um, so there's one view, and you see this a lot in blog posts and in talks, kind of looking down on kind of data science practices, especially if you look at notebooks, they have a very bad reputation in some communities. And so all of these criticism, like data scientists should pick up better software engineering practices. They should use an IDE. They should start using abstraction, right? These notebooks are terrible, all global state, no functions, no abstraction. There's no testing whatsoever, heavy copy pasting, little documentation, terrible version control, right? Um, and then, yeah, out of order execution, this seems like kind of, why would you even consider this? But this is maybe a somewhat arrogant outside view, right? So from a software engineering perspective, yes, this seems weird. This seems like we've progressed beyond this. But if you actually understand how software, uh, how data scientists work, a lot of this starts to make sense. So data science, data scientists work quite different from a traditional software engineer. They have much more a science mindset. They start with a goal, and they try to solve a problem, try to model something where they don't even know whether it's possible when they start, right? So they have kind of vague goals, no clear specifications. And it's very, very exploratory. The graphic here is, the study is quite old, but I think it's very interesting. It shows 10 participants in a four hour experiment trying to solve a data science or modeling task. And what you see here over time is how accuracy improves. So different participants are more or less effective, but what you see is that pretty much everybody starts out with a very simple model that doesn't work particularly well, and then they try different things and they get better over time. And so it's this very incremental iterative process. And this is something that's actually 
quite well supported by notebooks. Notebooks have a few characteristics that make this attractive in this uh, environment. It provides very quick feedback, similar to a REPL on a command line, and it provides also visual feedback. So if you just want to kind of explore something, try something, um, test something, that's very nice. Also, it's really useful for incremental computation. I think this is something that's often underappreciated because you don't need to always re-execute the entire pipeline. You re-execute a cell or two. Right? And it's also easy to edit and share the notebook once you're done. So I think what we should understand is that just blindly recommending software engineering best practices is probably not the right solution here. We need to understand context. Documentation and testing is not an, a priority in the exploratory phase. It might be much more useful later. The whole idea of literate programming in notebooks makes much more sense once you know what you're doing, kind of doc documenting the final product. Right? So we, um, the place where I think research is much more useful and we need more help is when we, once we transition from notebooks to a production system. And I think we have pretty poor support there right now. We have something like nbconvert, how we can convert it to Python files. And then often what happens is that somebody rewrites this, puts this into production, and then it's also very hard to go back, right? So data scientists, once the code leaves the notebook, have a very hard time continuing to experiment on the production code, things go out of sync. So I think here it's much more useful to understand that data scientists actually have a quite different perspective than software engineers and that we can support them in their environment and then also help them getting things into production and helping them make sense of production, get some benefits of production later. And so this is one direction. But I also want to talk about the software engineering mindset. So what can a software engineer contribute to building these systems? And so again, we want, we want to build these systems that are much more than just building a component, right? Building the entire system around this. So we need to start thinking about systems, kind of much larger um, concept zooming out. And there are lots of challenges here. And I'll just pick four for this talk. Right? So I cover a lot of these in, in my lectures. But um, there are lots of interesting challenges here where they're often design challenges, things that software engineers are typically trained at where they may need to adjust a little bit, uh, but this is the kind of thinking that we teach software engineers to do. So one thing is thinking about the user experience, the user interface design. So there are lots of things where you think about how to um, use the predictions of a model, how to put them into production. And they're very, very different designs and they are suitable in different contexts. There is not a single design. Right? So if, if you think about this uh, PowerPoint example, the way that they produce productions here, uh, predictions, is you have to find this button, you have to click this button, and the, it doesn't automatically redesign your slide. It shows you a preview of a couple of different designs. And then you can click one of those designs, it changes your slide, but you can still go back, right? You can undo this. There's a lot of things that, um, the, there's a lot of steps of how this is really careful, right? The predictions are not very forceful, not very invasive. And different designs could be much more productive potentially in making your slides, helping developers to discover this feature and so on. But there's a trade-off here of how invasive are you, how forceful is the interaction, how easy it is to deal with mistakes and so on. Whereas in different contexts, let's say you want to have a smartwatch feature to detect faults in elderly people, you can start thinking about you probably don't want somebody to go out and find in the menu of the watch the right option, right? So you want a much more forceful interaction. So here, the design might be if you detect a fall, you're not calling an ambulance immediately, but maybe you give people 30 seconds to cancel this in kind of a visual and audio feedback, but you want to take some automated action, right? And there are lots of design challenges to think about how to design an intelligent experience, how forceful is it going to be, how often are you going to send notifications, is there going to be notification fatigue and things like this. The next step I want to talk about is 
I mentioned earlier that data scientists tend to focus on accuracy, but if you're actually trying to deploy models, a lot of other qualities matter, right? So yes, if you try to win a Kaggle competition, you have a fixed data set, go for accuracy. But in production, it suddenly matters how expensive it is to run the system, how expensive it is to train the system, what's the inference time, how long does it take, how much energy does it take if you're running on an edge device, how much data you need for training, how, what data quality do you need, do you have in production, can you learn incrementally, and then all these things that become really irrelevant in a production system, interpretability, robustness, security, privacy, fairness, and so on. Right? Um, Here's a nice example of this. Um, many of you will probably know this um, Netflix prize many years ago, where they tried to find a better prediction algorithm, recommendation algorithm for what movies to watch. And there were lots of entries and they were doing pretty well. They were outperforming Netflix's approach by far. But after some evaluation, Netflix decided to implement none of them. They stuck with their old method because the extra complexity the extra engineering effort and the runtime cost were not justifying the marginal or additional accuracy gains. Right? So accuracy is an important quality, but it's not the only one. If you're building a system, you actually need to trade off between different uh, qualities. You might pick a very different model. And there are lots of these kind of decisions that you need to think about. One thing that I just talked in class two days ago is where should the model live? It's kind of an architectural decision. The example that we had is this um, instant translation um, that a lot of these devices have, right? So you need some OCR component and some translation components. Do you do this locally on the phone? Do you do this in the cloud? Do you do this in some uh, a mixed combination? Do you maybe even do this on kind of Google Glasses in an uh, augmented reality kind of setting? And suddenly it matters a lot what the qualities of the models are, right? How much energy they take, how big they are, how often do you need to update them? What's the cost of running this? If you're running on batteries, if you want quick latency, uh, things like this. And different models might allow you to build very different kind of systems. Right? So there's a lot of trade-off thinking, thinking about the qualities of the system, kind of architectural style thinking that becomes really important and where understanding the models also is important. Right? So a software engineer needs to understand some of the trade-offs in the machine learning techniques as well. So they can't just use them blindly as black boxes. And then we can bring in a lot of uh, requirements engineering expertise. Right? So you could start with risk analysis. What's the worst thing that can happen to a system? Well, robot uprising, maybe not this year, but some philosophers uh, say one in 10 chance in the next 100 years for human extinction due to artificial intelligence. You don't have to believe this, right? But even if you think about your own system, what are the things that can go wrong? And there we have a long tradition of risk analysis understanding what are the things that can go wrong in the system, what's the impact on the system, what's the chance. A lot of this comes out of kind of a safety setting, right? Things like hazard analysis, fault tree analysis, failure mode and effects analysis. It's kind of thinking systematically through possible mistakes that can happen, through steps that lead to mistakes. And you can start thinking about fallback mechanisms, uh, redundancies, safeguards, and so on. And actually, to do this, you want to step back from the system. So machine learning components are kind of annoying in that we don't have specifications and we don't have guarantees, right? So they may make wrong predictions. Consider a smart toaster where you try to learn a model whether you should continue toasting based on some sensor inputs. Most of the time, this will work fine, right? 90% or 99% of accuracy is great, but it may make mistakes. And it may make mistakes in situations that you don't understand that are really weird. And it's kind of okay that it makes mistakes once in a while. So the toaster may occasionally burn my toast. I'm probably fine with this, but it should not burn down my kitchen. Right? So there are certain safety mechanisms that you want to think about. And you probably don't need to get perfect guarantees from the model. 
you probably want to think about this at the system level, things that we traditionally do, like hard constraints that overrule the model. So outside of the model, just check that the temperature reading doesn't go beyond a certain threshold. Or put in some external uh, fail-safe mechanisms. And very easy example in this toaster case is a thermal fuse, what you see in the picture here. This is a tiny, cheap hardware device that just stops conducting electricity when things become too hot. Right? So a simple thing outside the model, this is something that you wouldn't think about in a Kaggle competition, right? But outside the model, you start thinking about fail-safe mechanisms, safeguards, and you only get there if you systematically think about risk, if you think about what can happen if my model makes a wrong prediction. What other things would counter this? Can I undo the action? Can I prevent kind of bad consequences? You can think about humans in the loop, which is also super complicated. But that's the kind of thing that requirements engineers tend to think about a lot, right? Kind of safety mechanisms, understanding requirements, understanding safeguards, and so on. And the last design challenge I want to talk about is telemetry design. This is something that actually comes up a lot. You need this throughout. This is one probably of the big changes to what traditional software system that you want to see in production of how you're doing. So let's say in office they introduce this feature. They want to know, is this actually useful? Do people like this? And can we get additional data from practice to train this? Right? Can we identify mistakes? Can we collect additional feedback? And what often happens is that these systems send information back home, right? So they might collect, how often are you clicking this button? If you click this button, how often are you picking one of those designs? If you're picking one of those designs, how often are you undoing the selection afterward? You can also check, do people stop using that feature, right? So all these kind of indications that your model might be doing well or not so great, a lot of them are kind of indirect, it's kind of hard to pinpoint specific mistakes, but there's lots of ideas of how you can think about this, how you, how you can design this. So there are more obvious and less obvious examples of how to collect telemetry. In the simplest case, you might just ask users. So Skype will ask you after some calls how, how they're doing, right? So we just just ask you for feedback. And it actually doesn't do this for all calls. It does it more likely for calls that it thinks it might have been doing poorly. And in addition, it also has this report a problem button. Um, so with this button, you will never get positive feedback, but you may get some idea of how you're doing. It's always possible to just collect production data, maybe collect some slides from the users that they're trying to improve, and then have humans look at the results, like are the recommendations usable, are they not useful, right? Um, you could scale it to Mechanical Turk in some cases, or kind of crowdsource the labeling effects. Um, there are lots of possible designs here, it's expensive. And then there are some cases where it's actually really easy to get ground truth labels and see how you're doing if you're just willing to wait for a bit. So if you're predicting, for example, whether flight prices will rise or, or not, or stock prices, you can just wait a couple of days and you see what would have happened, right? It doesn't give you immediate feedback, but you can evaluate after the fact how you were doing. This is the last time I want to come back to Timmy. Um, because, so I haven't actually spoken to anybody at the company, but I hope that they kind of do the kind of things that I'm thinking they're doing. And I think they're doing pretty clever things at the system design level to think about how they're getting feedback, how they're getting telemetry information. So first of all, you see the star rating down here. That's straightforward, and I don't care about this too much. But they invested quite a bit in showing you the results in a nice way and having an editor where you can fix them. So traditionally, you might download the transcription, maybe in a Word file, and then what often happens is I go through it, I listen to it again, and I fix some of the words right before we kind of annotate it or publish it somewhere. But instead of doing this in a Word file, what if I would fix these things inside the editor? They could actually look at what I'm changing, right? So if I'm changing a word here that I'm seeing this shouldn't have been needed, it should have been a different word. Um, if I make the change, they actually have a very precise information where I think the transcription was wrong. 
They could use it as training data to improve it. They could see how often people make changes and where are there different kinds of problems. And to achieve this, I think it's important to think about well, there's an opportunity to get telemetry data, very valuable fine-grained telemetry data, but how do I get people to actually use this editor and fix my mistakes? And this is again where I think you need to think outside the model, think about the system at a larger scale. So what Timmy does is they actually have a very nice interface where the text and the audio is synchronized. So you can jump in the audio, start listening in somewhere, and it shows you where in the text you are. Or you can jump in the text and it will jump to the right position in the audio. If you just want to listen to a small segment here, you can just jump there and listen to this part. Right? This is something that I can't easily do in my word editor. Also, they highlight words that they're not sure about, right? that they're more likely to be wrong, so they kind of point your attention. And all of these things, I think, are quite useful to keep you in the system, to encourage you to provide telemetry data without being invasive, without asking you about this, without uh, needing human labels. So this is the kind of thing that I think by thinking about this from a software engineering perspective, thinking about this from a design perspective outside the model, taking the larger system into account, this is, I think, where this becomes really interesting. Um, there are lots of challenges about how to do telemetry, how to get uh, things about kind of slow feedback, how to deal with privacy. It's a really big challenge, right? And there are lots of research happening in kind of machine learning communities, hands of debugging and things like this. Um, and um, there's lots of work to be done here, um, but I think there's lots of stuff that both data scientists and software engineers can contribute to. So I've shown you that we kind of need both expertise and that both can contribute something, right? And they're both specialized. So how, make, how do we make them work together as a team? Right? So the question is, we don't want them as separate units. We want them to work together. And I think education is the key. Um, I think actually DevOps is a great role model. I'm not talking about DevOps like yesterday as we need to also get machine learning into production. Yes, that's also the case. Um, and there's a lot of work there. But think of DevOps as a similar problem where you have developers and operators that are kind of coming from different backgrounds. They have different specialties. They have different goals. They were often kind of working against each other with conflicts. And what we did with DevOps was we give them a joint responsibility, we give them joint vocabulary, make them understand each other, give them some tools so that the developer might already containerize the application to make it easier in operations. But the developers by doing this also get some benefits, like they get some product, they get quicker into production, they get quicker feedback, right? They get some log files maybe, um, and the operations people can use this information and offer more infrastructure that's then useful to developers. So you have still distinct roles, right? People in distinct roles, but joint responsibilities. You kind of think about, let them work together toward a joint tool and a lot of joint tooling. And I think this is where we need to go um, in building software engineering for a machine learning systems. We need some infrastructure that crosses things, right? So we, did, we don't need to throw away notebooks, but we need to get a way, uh, get a way to get data scientists to think about some of the qualities that matter in production, right? Beyond just accuracy, we need to help them to transition from a notebook into production give them infrastructure, how production data, telemetry data might help them to get back. And so my view here is that we want interdisciplinary teams, split expertise, but joint responsibilities. Just as in DevOps, we need joint vocabulary, joint tools. We need system thinking, at least some awareness of this, right? They don't need to be fully expert in each other's roles, but they need to kind of start communicating, start understanding each other, and some awareness of production uh, quality concerns um, and risk and uh, so on. So this is all I have. This is what I'm trying to pitch here, right? So 
it's kind of from an uh, education perspective. What I'm saying is essentially teach people to work together and probably help them build some tools. I have a class where I'm teaching software engineering for AI enabled systems. Uh, the material is online if you're interested. Feel also free to copy this class or look at this. If you're interested in research in this area, I have an annotated bibliography. And if you just want to get into this, I can recommend this book, Building Intelligent Systems, here, which doesn't go super deep, but it gives a great overview and the heart is in the right place. Um, we're using this as a textbook for the class as well. So, what I try to do today is kind of give you, kind of first of all, pitch that we really should focus on building, operating, and maintaining systems with machine learning components, right? Not just building the model, but really building the system. And that data scientists and software engineers have different expertise that we both need. There's many engineering concerns that we, at the system level typically, that we want to reason about. And the way forward, in my view, is really interdisciplinary teams kind of keep people with different specialties, but bring them together, right? Create a joint vocabulary, create awareness, maybe just some joint tooling um, to help them work together. That's all I have. Thanks. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, great talk. I could hear people clapping at their homes already. <laughs> Great. Uh, plus, actually, during the talk, there were quite some questions that have been um, uh, posted in the Q&A uh, section. You can still post questions uh, as well and vote for questions. And based on the votes, we'll, we'll go to the questions now, starting with the number one for the moment, and just keep on voting and sending questions in the meantime. So number one question here is the following. Um, so which software engineering approaches, traditional approaches, uh, in parentheses, do you believe require urgent adaptations? to support development and operation of AI-based systems? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. So when I, I kind of started this with an education mission and then thought maybe there are some research challenges along the way, right? And I feel like um, most of the time we can find some fairly straightforward adoption, like all the risk analysis techniques, they change a little bit because you're focusing on slightly different things, you're asking slightly different questions, but you're just assuming that machine learning models could be wrong and then you use fault trees in a similar way and so on. So I think a lot of times we're just not pushing existing methods far enough, but there's certainly a lot of change, a lot of things where we can do more research. I, I feel like telemetry is one of them where we don't have a lot of systematic knowledge about how to design this. Um, maybe in general, architecture, kind of architectural patterns, there's some early efforts in trying to um, kind of find what's out there, but it's not like design patterns or classic architectural tactics that there's a well-defined catalog, right, of kind of best practices. So I think there's something. And then I think the other big pain point is kind of going from kind of notebooks, kind of exploration into production and back, right? So I think that's, I think, a larger research area that's interesting. Ooh, ooh, right, and I forgot to mention who posted. So the question was asked by Silverio Martinez Fernandez. So thank you for the question. Uh, so let's go to the second question. Uh, so this one is by uh, Justus Bogner, uh, who asks, uh, do you have any best practices to share for the integration of AI ML components in, in a system? For example, with respect to encapsulation, reliability, flexibility, interoperability, anything to watch out for in comparison to more traditional uh, components and practices so I think think of this as a safety critical system think of this as something where you want to look at mistakes between components where you kind of give up the notion that you can get away with unit tests right so you do some unit tests but you need a lot of testing and production system level testing um, so that's I think I mean, we do this in some other systems as well, um, but I think this is much more needed here, kind of thinking about this chaos engineering as another one, right, which I think would fit quite well into kind of another form of testing and production, testing complicated systems that are hard to test otherwise. Um, 
thinking about feature interaction, thinking about um, data flows, kind of just modeling this, right? So we have techniques for architectural modeling, the architectural data flow modeling and things like this. But still in practice, a lot of people kind of just build a jungle of pipelines and then don't understand where data sets originate from other data sets. I think there are a bunch of these areas. I don't know that I have a fixed list, right? So I think in every single area, there's probably a bunch of practices that we can look for and adopt. There's a lot to do with data handling. There's a lot of to do with safety. Um, lots to do with testing and kind of testing and production. Um, I don't have the sense that we can get very far with encapsulation beyond kind of just deploying something as a service, um, right? And having this isolated in that sense, but it's not isolated in the sense of data flow. So, so actually, many of these things you mentioned, like they go more towards like more um, like heavy, like more more disciplined, quote unquote, processes that like uh, so so like That's things like question. agile things. Would that still work or? or Probably, right? So also, I mean, even chaos engineering is kind of has a flavor of agile and so on. And also all of these things have this notion of don't be stupid, right? Um, don't, we, we do things because we know that there are risks that we need to iterate quick, quickly, right? Um, I think what you talked about yesterday, kind of pushing things quickly into production, having a good infrastructure for testing and production is probably a very, very good foundation to build systems in a more flexible way, right? So it's not, it's not, I think, kind of heavyweight in the sense of waterfall is not the right thing because you don't know where the model is going. You need to update this, right? It's much more monitoring and production. Mm -hmm. Although I think if some system, uh, some companies had done more upfront risk analysis, we would have a lot fewer news stories about AI going bad. Um, but, but then again, you have kind of, it might be better to quickly grow, get something out there, get startup capital, and then fix things when you need to, right? Um, but it's because it seems like, yeah, for traditional systems, people have an idea what kind of process do they go to. But here, like this, you can actually go either way. It depends on um, the focus, basically. Yeah. And the risk. A... Yeah, I suspect Agile is still kind of very much in scope, kind of also the startup kind of um, building early prototypes, right, seeing whether it works. But I think thinking about some more disciplined approaches for testing, some more disciplined approaches for requirements, thinking about fairness early, right, these kind of things would be useful. Thank you. So, so then next question by uh, Kasper Lasenius. Uh, so uh, it's an empirical question. Basically, do you have any empirical support for the claim that the main problem is the lack of knowledge about software engineering methods amongst teams developing commercial systems with AI components instead of a need to de evolve or develop software engineering methods to deal with new challenges introduced by AI as part of systems? So is it like they don't know about what exists or is it that there's many new challenges actually and that's why they're overwhelmed and, and so on? I don't have any systematic study. Um, this is my impression from talking to people in different places. Um, if you bring up some of those t safety techniques or kind of um, risk analysis techniques, they are usually not, haven't thought about this. I mean, in some places, yes, like when they do self-driving cars, they are much more careful about safety, right? But if it's a web service or something like this, that, or an app that often has some sort of safety implication, maybe not in the case sense of killing people, but kind of creating harm, even psychological harm, right? Um, um, I don't have any hard evidence. Um, this, is, this is, I think, more a conjecture from my side. But in, put in a different way, that's an opportunity for researchers actually to kind of look into that and, and yes. see. If, uh, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, so that's good news for any uh, PhD student <laughs> in, the, in the room there. Uh, okay, so the uh, next question is uh, by Yonetaro Kawada. Uh, which academic community is the best place to find ML ops or AI ops related academic papers? Uh, IEEE, ACM, Europe, and so on. So um, there is a 
I don't have this right now, but I can send you a link afterward. There's a reading list um, from some German company on ML ops that has a very, very long list of books and articles and blog posts and so on. That would be my first starting point, probably. In the academic sense, um, I don't have seen that much ML ops uh, actual research. I think this is much more in production. And this is again um, what's really new compared to traditional um, DevOps. I mean, using machine, again, there are two parts, right? So there's using machine learning to improve DevOps, and then there's DevOps to deploy machine learning pipelines. Right? So for the first part, I think there's much more research um, kind of predicting early whether a build will fail and things like this. For the second part, I think there's a lot of practice. I haven't seen that much research in this area. I think much more in terms of gray literature, blog posts, books. Uh, so again, an opportunity actually for researchers to, to look there, but of course it requires also collaboration with companies to actually have real data and, and real observations there. So that's, uh, and, and I think the big challenge is always what's really new conceptually, right? Um, and to me, often a lot of things seem new and then it seems like traditional approaches, if you apply them, can get you quite far, right? So you kind of need to think first about how far can we push this and then what's left. I think there are lots of interesting research challenges if you go far enough, right? It's just, um, just not because they haven't thought about um, safety and risk analysis doesn't mean that there are no techniques to do this, right? And that it wouldn't be easy, in a sense, to do this. Right? True, true. So, uh, now, uh, actually, so the word risk has been mentioned a couple of times now, and actually the, the next question is actually about that. Uh, Matteo Camilli asks, uh, can you please elaborate a bit more on what does risk analysis mean in the context of machine learning systems? Is it something that should be done during early design stages continuously, uh, both offline and online after gaining uh, runtime evidence? Right, so so there, there are lots of these examples about machine learning systems doing something wrong, right? So I showed the chatbot in the beginning. Um, and there are lots of examples of robotics application doing something weird, um, like we had some delivery robots in Pittsburgh blocking sidewalks for wheelchair users, right? So this is something that kind of then blew up on Twitter, right? It's, and there's some, to some degree, you can think about how much are you willing to just experiment in production and then address it when it happens. It might tank your company, but often it may be a reputation hit, but then you promise to be better, right? Um, I think ideally, if you want to be responsible, you probably want to think about risks early. And the way to think about risk is what could go wrong, right? So there's, um, there are different forms of risk analysis. So um, fault trees are typically going backward from here's a bad result to what can lead to this bad result. And the, the other techniques like failure modes and effects analysis, they go forward kind of thinking about here are all my components. and what if those components fail? So you can just think about every single machine learning component that you have. Think about what if it makes a wrong prediction? What's the consequence of this? Have you thought of a safeguard? What's the chance of that the safeguard can can deal with this, right? What's it, what's the risk of this specific failure? So I think doing that early is probably a good idea to understand what you're doing, to think early about safeguards and the entire system, right? Not just like 99% accuracy sounds good, but it still means that you're making mistakes from time to time. And there's some work on kind of some verification techniques, but since we don't have specifications, I think we will never get to a space where we can be perfectly confident in anything learned from uh, with machine learning from data, um, right? With however much testing we want. So we always need to think about this at the system level, in my view. But actually, so your your point is that actually the existing ways of dealing with risk actually might actually work out. It's just that you need to be more um, strict, more 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 I, explicit with them. I, I'm not an expert on this. Um, this is actually 
when looking at this, this is my feeling that I need to understand requirements engineering way better. This is one of the gaps um, that I think requirements engineers can teach us a lot of how to think about feedback loops, how to think about risk, how to think about mitigation strategies and kind of um, avoiding harm, right? Um, my impression is that these techniques that exist are a great starting point. Um, they, they are designed for kind of aviation systems and so on. And it, also a lot of these systems already have humans in the loop that are not always perfect, right? Which is similar to an AI component. Um, and they're probably extensions. And there are some places, again, self-driving cars are more carefully thinking about kind of safety requirements and risks, right? Mm -hmm. um, but my impression is that we are introducing um, machine learning into a lot of applications like TME, like uh, Office and so on, without thinking about, to, without very much careful thinking about what could go wrong. Cool, interesting points. It's, uh... So let's see. So I've been like some restructuring and the rating of the ranking of the questions here. So the next one is now is just popped up. So it's a uh, uh, Mahmoud uh, Al Fadel. Uh, where do we stand today for software ecosystem and machine learning? In other words, what kind of problems related to software ecosystems can be solved by machine learning? Um, not sure how to understand this question. Um, so yeah, I think probably just like yeah, maybe prediction models to to help. So, I think it's maybe related to your work on software ecosystems. So, so as software engineering researchers, we can do a lot where we use machine learning in software ecosystems. For example, to predict whether um, a dependency is likely to be buggy or something like this, right? Or find bugs and things like this. Uh, predict the stability. Um, um yes this is this is not the way that i tend to think about th uh, problems in this direction right so um i tend to think about is there a problem in software ecosystems and then how can we solve it and machine learning what might be one approach I'm not really thinking about what are all the machine learning things that i could apply to software ecosystems so going to be uh, understanding the problem and then choosing the approach to use. Mm -hmm. yeah I don't want to put machine learning into everything just because, right? Um, actually, I avoided the topic for a long time. I'm teaching this because I felt somebody has to teach this. Um, and I now get a little bit interested in kind of reading about this and all the, all the things, but it's not, to me, it's not machine learning is the big future that we need to push into everything. Um, that's at least not my view of the world. You always might edit this question out of the video numbers. <laughs> I, I, I'm not worried about sharing this publicly. It might not age very well, but... <laughs> cool. So, um, right, so the, the next question, uh, Tushar Sharma. Uh, notebooks are quick prototypes, and that's fine, but the problem starts when such prototypes are converted into or treated as products literally. So okay. it's more common than a question. Yeah, I, I completely agree, right? And the... So there, there are some places where notebooks are used in production as shell scripts and so on, like Spotify, I think, does this. And um, I think this, this speaks again to the problem of transitioning. Right? So quick prototypes, fine. And from what we heard from kind of in interviews and so on, what typically happens is um, after the prototype is fine in a notebook, somebody re-implements this in a proper system, proper, right? And then the problem is that you can't go back, right? So the data scientists kind of cut off at this point. Yep, so you really need to, to have this ongoing conversation and, and, and otherwise you lose the traceability to this. Uh, right, so, so a bunch of empirical studies show that, so there are a number of studies on problems with notebooks and there are a bunch, versioning is one of them, kind of exploration, uh, cleaning up. Um, and one of the big ones is transitioning into practice. Mm. Uh -oh. But, uh, so, um, so it's 1 p.m. Do, do you still have a couple of minutes for additional questions? Uh, Anya. Oh, yeah, sure, okay, because there's still uh, some uh, questions uh, building up there. So, for example, the first one here, we have uh, Danny Dick who says, uh, Christian, when you talked with the data scientists, what did they tell you they need from our software engineering community? Were they aware of their needs from us? 
I haven't asked the questions this way. Um, the and I tend to speak to people who are often already in kind of a a position that they talk about software engineering or they recognize software engineering. Um, I haven't talked to we have talked to some people who are trying to get notebooks into production. Um, yeah, I don't think I have a good answer for this. Um, the big questions um, talking to people at Uber, for example, is how do how do we do safety certification? Right, anything where you want to give some guarantee or have very high confidence, but I think that's a very high bar and, and, and a long goal. I think that's that's a clear, obvious problem beyond, and they think we might have, but um, beyond this, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So, so again, there might be room for people to actually do these kind of studies, uh, talk to them, and then see. Uh, like there were like there were some been some papers that people interviewed software engineers. Right. Whether well, their main question might be the opposite way, actually going to data science. Yeah, yeah there, there are a couple of papers that also interviewed data scientists, um, and that that usually look at pain points more than at if you had a magic tool or if you know a software engineer, how can they help you? Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect, again, if we maybe look a little bit at the DevOps literature of how did we get to those place, places like bringing people together, right? So did, did the software engineers know upfront what they wanted to from operators or was this more something that came up with the opportunities as we shifted paradigms, right? Um, True, and I think it is interesting uh, comparison with, with the role of the DevOps because it is kind of the same similar challenges there for the collaboration. And they're a couple of years ahead, right? So I think we can learn from them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here we have uh, Michel Vasconcelos who asks, how do you perceive reuse uh, in heavily based machine learning projects? He, he means with all this throwaway prototyping when using notebooks, like is, is there something like reuse and how should how are people doing that? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't have any any good idea here. There's some discussions in the literature about reusing models, especially deep learning models, right? So you train something and then you retrain it for for the specific use cases. Um, uh, but I don't I don't have any insights in this area. Because there's always copy paste reuse, but probably you mean that kind of yeah more. So in notebooks, yes. So in notebooks, there's a lot of copy paste uh, instead of abstraction. Mm -hmm. But as long as you're exploring things, as long as, you, as long as you're testing this, this is essentially just because they have poor versioning mechanisms, it's much more common that people just clone code, modify it, and then throw it away or throw the old one away, right? And keep the old one around in case something goes wrong and they need to go back, right? So copy paste happens a lot in this context. Um, I think we're building a lot of models that we're throwing away, but that's also normal just because of the exploratory nature, right? Um, yeah, it's basically a prototyping process where you uh, build a couple and then to arrive at the real, uh, real product there. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's prototyping is one way of looking at it, but I think it's it feels much more sciencey actually than prototyping, right? So with prototyping, you often already have a sense that this will work in some way. Where science, you start with a hypothesis and you don't know how you're getting there. Mm. Um, kind of feels more like feels more like research than kind of engineering a lot of the data science. But again, I'm I'm not too deeply into this. This is often kind of an outsider view. So um, yeah, so we have uh, let's see what the, okay, we have a couple more questions. So um, here's a Sebastian Moser who says. Uh, that notebooks are also a perfect example of the literal programming paradigm, which you mentioned that sometime. Isn't that all is it software engineering related? Meaning, I guess, is that also like a good practice? Yeah, they're often pushed as liter literate programming, right? And also, there's kind of this is a new version of the academic paper or the lab notebook. Um, this is not how they are used most of the time. So, there are many studies on this, not my research, but many studies that essentially show the way that people are working with notebooks is they're writing something, um, they're exploring, they're exploring, they're deleting something, and then they're cleaning. And cleaning is 
for different purposes, for putting this into production or for sharing it with colleagues um, or putting this on your web page. And in cleaning, this is when you start to insert text mostly. Um, so if you, if you look at notebooks before them, and there are some studies on kind of millions of notebooks, they usually don't have a lot of text. They're usually not used in this literate programming style where I think the original idea is develop the text and the code together, right? So maybe first say what the code is doing, that you get a mental model and then you write the code, right? Or that you translate the text slowly into code. I don't think this is how notebooks are used. Uh, it's a literate programming environment, but they are almost always used that the text is added in the cleaning process later. Yeah, which is interesting because yeah, that concept that is goes back away. So it's interesting to see how they're different with like traditional literate programming. That's a... yeah, notebooks also go back, right? So I think the first notebook environment, I think Mathematica, um, was mm -hmm. 89. So okay. it's, it's fairly old. Um, it has become extremely popular in recent years, right? And it's used in different ways in different communities, I think. You can use it as a lab notebook where you essentially always document what you're doing. But that's not the popular use that we're talking about these days, I think. Wait, so the HPI this... community, by, by the way, is really into notebooks these days. So if you look at Kai, there are usually does, uh, yeah, probably a dozen of notebook papers and tools. Um, and they have a lot of knowledge, empirical knowledge and tools about how to improve things. So, and usually not kind of let's introduce testing or let's introduce functions, but more can we do a more exploratory kind of undo mechanism? Like Brad Myers at CMU does some interesting stuff with recording things and undoing. Or well, there's some work out of Microsoft uh, using slicing to clean up the notebook that you throw away stuff that you don't need to produce a figure, right? So those kind of things um, come out of, all out of the HCI community these days. Um, and they, I think, have a pretty good understanding of how people use notebooks. Which comes down back to your point that you need to understand the workflow of, of data scientists and really adapt yeah. to their workflow. That's, uh, I had the same arrogance, right? So if you look at notebooks, uh, it seems so weird if you're used to IDEs and kind of programming and kind of functions, right? Mm -hmm. But I think if you understand what they are for and how people use them, it actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I suggest that we do two more questions and then I'll give you a break because you think <laughs> bored of the question here. Uh, so, and that's also why we do the first one is still a choice to vote the, set, the last question. So the first question here is from uh, Manishankar Mondal. Uh, what should be the most important thing when there is a collaboration between a data scientist and a software engineer? Good question. I would, I would think getting a good understanding of what the system is and the role of the model in that system, right? So the, the system has a component in it, but there's much more to it. So essentially that you're working towards a joint goal. So if you're designing the transcription service, for example, start thinking about risk, start thinking about telemetry, start thinking about user design, because it will inform your modeling choices, right? So you kind of, I think, Think about the qualities that are important beyond just accuracy of the model and how this fits into the larger system. And I think that's something that these two can do together, even though the software engineers will probably drive some of that discussion. Um, but I think we need some awareness, some joint goals, uh, set up uh, kind of a target. Cool, nice. So, so now the, the final question, and there was a bit of change there in the ranking. So the final question is here from uh, Arpit Sharma. Uh, in case of safety critical software systems, one can use formal methods for ensuring reliability. Uh, what kind of techniques could be used for verifying systems with machine learning components? It becomes even more important because we don't have concrete specs for machine learning components. So with safety critical systems, there's also the question, what do you verify? And that's usually not the safety property at the end. I mean, there's a safety property, but that means something else. Um, so you typically think about kind of redundancies and chances of failures and how failures com compound and kind of influence each other and how safeguards work. And you can do some quantitative analysis of risk. And I think you can do all of those things also with machine learning components pretty much the same way, where you just think of the machine learning component as an unreliable part of your system. 
So I think that part is the same. I think we will never get to a point where we can verify the correctness of a machine learning component because we don't have a specification. Right? So we can kind of say how well it's doing with regard to some test set. Um, and we're usually okay with some mistakes. Um, in my view, this is actually um, <clears throat> thinking of this as bugs or as verification is kind of a weird view. I think it's much more like specification mining, requirements engineering. We are trying to interview the data to figure out kind of what we're building. Wrote a blog post about this that I didn't talk about here. Um, I think it's much more validation than verification that we're really concerned about with machine learning components. Um, there's some techniques out there, uh, quite a bit of research on verification of deep neural networks and so on. They usually refer to specific invariants, um, like robustness invariants, like the result is stable with a certain area around the training data or around a single input, or the result is invariant with regard to a certain fairness property. And so there you can give some sometimes probabilistic, sometimes formal guarantees. Um, there's a bunch of kind of interesting formal methods work to prove some properties, how to scale, and it's very limited properties that we are uh, proving, but it's not correctness of the thing. It's typically some invariant like robustness, like fairness, like privacy, uh, in certain privacy properties. Basically, like a clever, uh, a clever use of formal approaches, basically for specific properties. It's, uh, yeah. So, so one way you can think of the deep neural network as a simple, fairly simple program. It has a ton of constants, but it's just a few matrix multiplications and a bit of multiplications and plus and minus and so on. Right. So, technically, these are much simpler programs than a lot of other programs that we analyze, except for scale, and there's kind of cool kind of abstract interpretation work and kind of things like this in this area. Um, but again, because you don't, the specification that you have is usually just an invariant and you prove that invariant and it's not correctness of the model in the sense that for a given input, it gives you a certain output. We don't have an Oracle. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. So, so this was the last question. Thanks again, uh, Christian, for an amazing talk and taking time to uh, answer questions in detail. Uh, very appreciated. Thank you everybody for attending. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you.